Good evening. This is John Coates here in Natick, Massachusetts. This tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. This is December 18, 2000, and this evening we are pleased to have with us Septimo Tiberio. Did I pronounce that correctly? And they called you Seth. Is Seth. That, that correct? May I ask you how old you are, Seth? 82. And when you were born in 1918, I think. 1919. And June you said 9th. you were a World War One baby. World the, War One baby. <laughs> you were born in June. The war ended uh, five months after you were born. So that's you were You're very a his history. I'm not. <laughs> you were very historic. Uh, what is your current marital status? My, uh, my wife passed away just 13 years ago. 13 last years week. ago. And did do you have children? Four beautiful children and ten grandchildren. Ten grandchildren? Any grandchildren? No great. I'll, I'll bet they're coming along very soon. Mm. Where were you born? I was born in Malden, Massachusetts. Malden, Massachusetts. Were, were you raised there? Yes. The first nine years there. Then ten years in Wakefield. Then back to Malden for about three years. Then I went into service. So you went into the service from uh, Malden. From Malden. But, yeah, tell us about your mom and dad, your family. What uh, what did they do? Well, my father came over in 1897, and he pretty well knew exactly what he wanted because he went back to Italy and married a little 15-year-old girl, <laughs> and uh, she had eight boys and four girls, seven brothers and four sisters, hardworking, beautiful people. You were never alone, were you? <laughs> you? You were always surrounded with people. What did, what, did, uh, what kind of work did your dad do? He was a con uh, foreman on construction. He was a uh, pretty smart in what he did. What he did uh, for for a company out in uh, New York. But then when he came here to Boston, matter of fact, he's got some history written in a, in a book on one page on some of the jobs he did, and I was surprised when I read it. Uh, it was, one of his first jobs was from Framingham to Marlboro, a gas line that he put in way back in the early 1900s. Is that right? Yeah. So he's part of uh, New England history then? Yeah. That's very good. What, what about your mom? What did she do? My mother was... Uh, raised all those kids. Raised all those kids. Yeah. Made, uh, made pizza all the home cooking, made our clothes, yeah. and uh, if she's not in heaven, I don't want to go there. <laughs> I, 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 I'm to, very positive yeah. she is. What was the community like, Malden? What was it like when you were growing well, up? Well, it's, it's an Italian section of Malden, and uh, like uh, all other communities, uh, kids are kids, we played our games, and. Did you go to school there? Uh, I, yes, school? I went to yeah. the grammar grades there. Yeah. And then in Wakefield, we moved when I was in the sixth grade. And then uh, in the eighth grade, they, I don't know if it's the right word or not, but they threw me out. <laughs> they threw you out? While I was working, getting up at about four in the morning and uh, working on a farm, and then I had to be in school for eight o'clock. And uh, I had milk in my pants that would smell. I'd fall asleep in the desk. And so, even though it was the law then, at 16 years old, that's as far as I went. About what time, uh, what years were these? Well, uh, what age would I be? Uh, uh, 10, 11, 12? Yeah, was this a result of the Depression that uh, were a lot of people poor in, in your area? Um, average. Uh, it's it's it, the areas around here are so built up now. Mm. It's hard to think of working on farms. Yeah. But back then, I suppose a lot of people. Well, did. The, 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 when I went to work, it was after they threw me out. I went to work steady. I was working about a hundred hours a week. There on the farm, seven cents an hour. You tell that the kids today, they won't believe you. And uh, I did about three years of that. Then I went to the CCC camp, if you know what that was. Civilian Conservation, Conservation Corps. Corps. Yeah. Was, uh, and that was a dollar a day, all you could eat <laughs> and hard work. What sort of work did you do there? I was splitting logs. 
I was a pretty big kid for 17 years old. I was 188 pounds, and they gave me a nice little 14 pound sledgehammer, and I spread logs all day. For a dollar a day? Dollar a day. And they sent 25 of that at home. And they gave you five, and you didn't get a chance to spend it. <laughs> <laughs> When you left school and then you went into the uh, CCC, um, let's bring it up to say 1939, 1940. Uh, were you working with the CCC at that time? No, I only we only stayed there six months, okay. five months. My brother and I weren't together, and then my father found some work for us, so he called us. Uh, you could go out any time that you had work, and we worked for Huey Non and F. A. Snow some contractors in, in around Boston, Barn Brothers, and we did all construction work. I ran a jackhammer for a couple of years, and then after that, we were getting to the age of where, where I went into the service. I enlisted. Okay, you're 17 or 18 now, is that correct? Uh, well, 17 when I came out of the, out of the CCC camp, Yeah. and then I worked about three years in construction. So you're 20 years old, and was there a draft on at this time? I think it was just before the yeah. draft. I, the, the actual dates I went in, I don't even remember, 1940, I think. 1940, and did you enlist in 1940? I enlisted. And what branch of the service did you the enlist? The 1st Infantry Division, the Big Red Run. Did you have opportunities to get into any other branch of the service, the Navy? I actually enlisted for Coast Guard. But uh, when I got down to Fort Devens, they just said infantry, and that's where I went. So we were stationed at Fort Devens for a couple of years. And the 1st Infantry Division at that time, they were in Plattsburgh, New York before that, and then Fort Devens was their home base. Okay, so you went into the 1st Infantry Division in 1940. 40. So you were in the Army before the war. Yeah, Can you before the draft started. Yeah, and can you remember where you were on Pearl Harbor Day? Did you hear the, you know, the Pearl Harbor is oh, yes. attacked? Can you remember where you were then? I'm trying to think of whether it in 40 or early 41. They had to be 40. So I probably was at, at Fort Devens. At Fort Devens in yeah. Massachusetts. And you were in the Big Red One, the 1st Infantry one. Division. Uh, tell us about going to Fort Devens. You were 20 years old? I, I was 22. Yeah. Yeah. We, we missed a couple of years yeah. there. Okay. You were I 22? I did four or five years of construction. And had you been away from home before? No. Okay, so you're <coughs> kind of a kid and you're off into the Army. Tell us about going to Fort Devens. Well, uh, once I was in there, uh, I got used to uh, you know, routine, getting up, uh, doing your whatever you had to do, KP, a lot of uh, training, plenty of hiking. What time of the year was this? Was it cold? Was it hot summer? Well, you mean when I first started? Yeah. Uh, it probably was pretty close to Pearl Harbor Day, in the middle of the winter. The middle of the winter. Yeah. And you're in the woods, out in the woods of Massachusetts. Can you remember what tra kind of training ha you had or testing that you had that decided what you would do in the Army? Well, at that point in time, I was in an infantry. You were in an infantry. The first division, which was infantry. Yeah. And when, did you go in with anybody else, or did you go in with I went in with a friend of mine. We were working, and we decided to enlist. Somebody you knew from, we separated from town quickly. or school? No, just a neighbor. He was a neighbor. And after Fort Devens, um, where did you go from there? Well, from there, we went to uh, Georgia for maneuvers, and then uh, Blanding, Florida. And from Blanding, after three months there, we went to uh, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, I forgot where, where we departed. That's where we departed from. This Out was, of Pennsylvania. Yeah, 1942, August uh, 2nd of 42. Went overseas on the Queen Mary. 
October 2nd, 42. Mm. Let's back up a second here. When you look at old newsreels today of guys in training at, at about the time you were in there, they seemed, uh, some of them had broomsticks, they didn't really have rifles. Uh, would you consider yourself well equipped for what you were going to do? Uh, yeah. You yeah, had to. Well, we, we used to go to the rifle range, 10 mile hike, two or three times a week, and we'd actually fire live ammunition, or fire uh, live ammunition. Yeah. We were firing at targets. So um, we had the machine guns and the BARs and the M1 rifle. Would you explain the BAR, the Browning Automatic Rifle, right. is that correct? Did you receive any advanced or specialized training beyond basic training when you left Fort De no. Devons? No. It was so it was a strictly infantry work that you were going to do. Then you went to Georgia, you went to Florida, you went to Pennsylvania. Whereabouts were you in Pennsylvania? Inverary. Is there such a place? Inverary, Pennsylvania. It was a place of where we were going to depart from. We got our shots there and everything. So it was a depot to get you ready to go overseas. Yeah. Now, I think you just mentioned you went overseas in October? Uh, the, uh, August 2nd, I think. August 2nd. Of uh, 42. Of uh, 42. And you went over on the Queen Mary? So you sailed out of New York City? We were almost 20,000 men on that ship. Tell us, about, now tell us about going from Pennsylvania over to New York. Did you know uh, where you, you, were, the, you were going overseas? Oh, yeah. You did? We were, we were, they prepared us for all the shots yeah. that we needed. And How did you feel about this? Not bad. It was, it's what everybody else had to do. So. <laughs> And so you get in a bus or something, and you go down to the docks. That's how I don't remember. And That's all I know is that uh, it took us four and a half days to get to Scotland. And you went up to Greenock, I, I take it. Greenock, Scotland? Oh, I don't know where. OK. And you, four and a half days, that's a, a, a very fast crossing. Yeah, and we zigzagged, too. And were to were there other ahead. ships with you? No. You were not a part of a convoy or anything. No. You relied on your speed to get you over Relied on there. the speed, and I'm not sure what the mathematics is on this. Uh, you probably took a submarine seven or eight minutes to, uh, to line up for a torpedo or something. So I think they were changing course every seven or eight minutes. And with the speed of the ship, that's probably the way they avoided. Can you remember getting off the ship? And I can remember a lot on the ship. You had your rifle, your barracks bag, your pack, and there were no beds, but they had stripped the whole ship for that many people. And you got in line to eat, and after you got through, you got in line to eat again, and you only ate twice a day, because it took 12 hours to get there. But in the meantime, you're playing cards and shooting dice. <laughs> Where did you sleep? No place. No place. Wherever you were. You just dragged your rifle and bag along, and. Sometimes whenever you slept, you slept right there on the deck or wherever you were. And it took 12 hours to get to eat again. And we just kept going until we ate 10 meals and four and a half days we were there. I don't think you would look back on that as being first class. Well, when you're, you're, you're young, you, you're going to take a lot of punishment. <laughs> I think that's what kept me alive. Yeah. The training that I had and you know, 22 years old, yeah. Okay, you're now in Scotland. Uh, where did you go from there? We stayed there about oops, uh, two or three months, maybe. And then from there, we went to England for more continuous training. What, would, what did you do in those two or three months in Scotland? The, 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 the usual, uh, you get up, do your exercises, hikes, always, always training, always uh, get in shape getting for, ready. for a lot of punishment. When, when you were in the States, and, and I guess your last place was Pennsylvania, did the uh, Army sit you down and say, you guys are going to go into a different culture, a different country? Did they prepare you for any of that? No, but uh, probably later on I'll get answer that. And <clears throat> when I was coming back, they warned us that it's going to be difficult to get used to getting back home again. 
and um, if you remind me, I can tell you what happened when okay, I came home. Okay, we'll get to that in a minute then. You were in northern. You were in Scotland, and you'd get additional training. Then you said that you were sent to England. How, did, how did you get to England? I don't know. What's the you go down on a train? A boat, probably a train. Or you sail down? I don't remember. And where did you go to Eng in England? We were in uh, somewhere in the area of Plymouth, England. So you were in the south of England, the southern coast of England. And what did you do there? There, to continue training for the uh, Oran Africa invasion, which I made D-Day. I made D-Day in Oran Africa. That was, I think, around November 2nd of 42. Okay, that's right. Now tell us, you sailed out of Plymouth. On the Monarch of Bermuda. And you sailed... About seven weeks on the water. Through the Straits of Gibraltar. Yeah. Did you see Gibraltar as you went through it? Well, probably I did, but I don't remember. Yeah. And you, uh, how many guys in your unit now? What what were you attached to? Well, I was on uh, this Monarch of Bermuda, which was a ship, and uh, it had to be a convoy, naturally, to, to carry the, the division to make the invasion. I, that's all I can remember. Okay, it's November 43, and you were about to invade the North 42. Africa. Excuse me, you're correct, 42. You're about to invade North Africa. You sail up into where, outside of Oran? Oran, Africa. And how did you go to shore? Did they pull shore, up to it? We were on the uh, LSTs, landing craft. Yeah. Landing craft, LCT, land craft troops. Boom. As soon as I hit the water, I hit the water right up to my neck, and I can't swim a stroke. <laughs> with about 75 pounds on me, you know. But managed to get in. Not too much opposition. We did fight, I think. I think we were fighting against the French and the Italians for a couple of days before things were settled and straightened out. Was this units of the French Navy uh, or Marines that you were up against? Do you know who was on the I, other side? I don't know. I know that. Uh, I was right aside of the the uh, battleship Rodney. I was right aside of the observer that was with us when we landed in Africa, and he was directing the fire from that ship. And those things, he, you could see them going through the air. And he was telling me how big they were. And I don't know, six, uh, sixteen or eighteen inch guns, and he said they weigh a ton and a half a piece. <laughs> And they would land, miss by a hundred yards, but he'd call back direct fire. I mean, uh, he'd call direct hit. And then when we advanced and we saw all the horses dead, still tied to the hitching post and everything from that barrage of... The Rodney is a, is a British battleship. Were you, uh, were there British troops with you? No. Were there any other troops from any other country with you, just Americans? Not that I know of. You know, do you know what your objective was? What, what were you guys told to do when you get ashore? Well, plan on, you know, we're in, we're in, in war now, you know. You have to, you're going to meet the enemy and you're going to fight. And that was the beginning of six months of combat. It finished on May 9th in 1943. Tell us where you went from Iran. We traveled mostly at the Red Mountain, the Atlas Mountains. We stayed mostly in the high ground. Are you headed toward the Kasserine Pass? Oh yeah, I went through all that. Gas for I the wonder, Kasserine Pass, all the big battles. If you were, well, was there anything before that that you would characterize as a big battle? Well, you have to fill in in between because, uh, like I say, I never put any of this together. I'm speaking now, for, I'm trying to remember 55 years ago. Yeah. I made the three D-Day invasions. I got over 300 to 350 days of combat. The six major battle stars. I was wounded twice. I became a platoon sergeant after, Norm after the Omaha in Normandy. And I lost a couple hundred men at, in just that period of time. 
Can you tell us about the Kasserine Pass? What happened there that, that, that battle? Well, it's a, I know that they, it was tremendous, a lot of, uh, I forget what they call them, SS mines or something. It was a little canister that had three prongs on it. You could pull it, push it, step on it, do anything, and it would trip an explosion to send that four or five feet into the air and then it would explode 360 degrees of shrapnel. So they were very effective. But I uh, can't tell you much more. You were, you were up against the German army now. Yes. Uh, rather than... Uh, well, the 1st Division, the 3rd Division, and yeah. the 9th Division, and the British were on our right, and we fought Romeo right up through Africa, all the way up to Tunisia. How did you travel? Walking and from Africa to Germany, right on my feet. You told us uh, well. You, you've told us so much already. I, I don't want to miss anything. Um, what rank did you hold now when, when you were in? I started off at Fort Devens yeah. in forty, private. From private, I went to a corporal, and then of a squad. From corporal, I went to a sergeant. From a sergeant, I went to the section sergeant. Uh, in a rifle company, you have three platoons of riflemen, and then you have one platoon of weapons, small weapons, 60 millimeter mortars, dirty air cool machine guns, and bazookas. I was in that platoon, the fourth platoon of a rifle company. And. Uh, from the size and I became the platoon sergeant. And that was after in Normandy, as soon as after after we landed. Okay, can let, let's not jump to Normandy. We we we're not given enough credit to what you did in uh, North Africa. Uh, what kind of weapon were you carrying then as part of the I platoon? was I had the uh, mortars, sixty millimeter mortars. And did you carry the tube or the plate or I uh, as a sergeant I don't, don't remember when I became sergeant, but as a sergeant uh, of the section of the mortar section, we, I had a 45. The uh, squad leaders would have the carbine. They, that was a little lighter than, instead of the M1s, but they had to carry the base plates and the mortars and uh, the ammunition carriers. So they, they all had carbines instead of rifles. In the papers that I read about you prior to this interview. Uh, there was an incident that uh, I, I don't want to miss. You were in a, in a foxhole and a German tank parked over you, is this? this? That was at the Battle of the Bulge. That was? That's a later, later on? So we don't miss it. Tell us, tell us about that now. Uh, I, could, I could go into some detail of that, but I'll try to make it brief. I'm going to go the night before, raining very heavy. And I still remember they sent me a replacement, and I couldn't see the hand in front of me. It was so dark. And I told the father to hold on to my trousers and went down. And we were literally so close that we could throw hand grenades at each other with the Germans. And then he got killed that night. But anyway, they called me and told me that they were going to put me in for a field commission, second lieutenant, that night. That was, I still remember the day, but it's very funny. That was the 12th of October, 1944. It was on October, Friday the 13th, is when I got a bullet through my shoulder from a sniper. And that was the next day. The battalion was lined up, we were going into Aachen, Germany. And uh, they had the E Company, G Company, H Company, and F Company. I was an F Company. And they put me way over in the right, and I didn't have a lieutenant. And so that's why they put me in for this battlefield commission. And they had a pivot on E Company, so I had a lot of ground to cover. So they gave me uh, two half tracks and a tank as an att attached to my platoon, and I had to cover all that ground. And by the time we come to the first street in Aachen, Germany, they were like condos. 
and there were little openings in between. That was the first street. And naturally, we had approach to it. We came to a house where we used a lot of ammunition up, but we thought there were Germans in there. And by the time we covered about three quarters of a mile, we got to this open area behind this row of houses. The Germans had already had mortars set up, all zeroed in for that particular area. So there comes a raindrop of mortar shells on us. I lost about 30 men right there, right in five minutes. And two of the, uh, I don't know if it was the half track or the tank, still had ammunition. The other two went back, but they were out of ammunition. So after bandaging people up and everything, uh, we went into the little alley and I had about three guys with me. All the rest were wounded or killed. And uh, the fellow in the tank said, uh, take a look around the corner and see if there's any bazookas. And I poked my head around the corner and a sniper on the third floor across the street put a bullet through my shoulder. And he saw this and he raised his gun up and knocked the wall down. But that's when I hit the ground, naturally. But all this was because they had left these mortars purposely for this, did what they had to do, and then they moved out. But the Germans had already moved back. They just left this, this last uh, thing. And uh, so I did, went out, I went out right out in the street, proving that there were no Germans around. And I walked right down the street to the battalion aid station, which is where E Company pivoted on. That's, so that was uh, that battle. And I don't know how many battles it takes to constitute a major battle star, but <laughs> I've seen about 50 or 60 of them. When, when did the incident with the tank take place? That was at the Battle of the Bulge. After I got wounded, I went to a hospital in Belgium. The bullet wasn't bad. It went in here and came out in the middle of my back. Probably that much more when I wouldn't be here. Then I went to a hospital in England. In about two or three weeks, it was all better, and I couldn't wait to get back. And at that point in time, I had probably 330, 340 days of combat. And uh, I got back to the Battle of the Bulge, snow on the ground. These holes were already drug. The, the ground must have been a little bit frozen. But for tanks, you'd dig round holes. And for other f type of fox holes, you'd drink long trenches. And I got into a hole there, and uh, there it was uh, close to Christmas. I still remember the kitchen. They were announcing hot food, and they came up and threw you a hot chicken leg or something, but you were lucky to get that. And they, the Germans broke through. You could tell that they were on there getting on their last stand, too. But they had white uniforms on to blend in with the snow. But the tanks came and rolled right over, one of them could roll right over my fox hole. I think it was a Mark 6, 60 ton tank. The track was probably 26 inches wide. If they knew I was there, I probably wouldn't be here, but they, they grind you down. Mm -hmm. they, they have armor plates where they can fire bullets that will ricochet right off and kill anything under the ground. And anyway, after this was all over, they broke through and got into right down as far as the battalion A station. Wait a minute, get, get back to being in the, your hole in, in a tank. Did it literally park over you? It, 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 rolled, it went right over me and continued on. But after, I don't know what the results of, uh, we finally won yeah. that battle. Yeah. But then the captain called me in and uh, he says, I've uh, been looking at your records, he says, no way you're going to stay here another day. You're going home. Okay, now s stop right there. Because we, we were in North Africa, and I want to make very sure uh, that you've told us all about that. How far east did you go? If you started at Iran, we went all and you were there for six months or so? to Tunisia. You went into Tunisia. I still Tunisia. remember that uh, it was Hill 109. It was Mother's Day, actually that the campaign was over. That was on May 9th, 1943. At that point in time, we landed, when we landed, we had the long underwear on, impregnated for gas, in case of gas attacks. And when I got through, 
I had thousands and thousands of crabs and lice on me. And I had never taken my clothes off. When it rained 20, 30 days, you got wet, you had to get dry, they dried on you. And for those 350 days of calm, I never had a roof over my head, except the sky. And we went back, when the doctor looked at me, he said, you go out in that field here, shave every single hair off your body and burn the blanket up. <laughs> and that was the end of the African campaign. Where did you go from Tunisia then? From there, we went back for training again and then we landed D-Day in uh, Gila, Sicily, and that was in 43. And it took us 38 days to take Sicily, and there was a lot of good stories in that one too. I don't know if you know it or not, we shot down 410 of our own paratroopers. The Germans came over while we were landing, and then when they left, our own paratroopers were coming over, and we were shooting at them, but we didn't know that they were ours, naturally. And they put their lights on and waving their wings, which is a no-no for an airplane. But after it was all over, I have all that history out on the table out there. Okay, we'll, we'll certainly put that as part of your record. Where did that incident happen, Seth? In, in the, when we were making the landing, the day we were in, making on the, the landing. On the day you landed in Sicily? In Sicily. I forgot the day we landed. It was 43. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have the date yeah. either. So how many, you were in Sicily about a month and a half? A month and a half. After we got through, we went up to Mount Edna. Then we went back to the uh, pitch pup tents in Anala Grove, back down near Gila. Then we went back to England, we got ready for Normandy. Okay, was, were you under Patton's command, overall Patton. command, when you, yeah. you were? I was right from here to you from Patton when he was talking to the, the whole division there, and he was swearing, and he was telling the nurses to leave if they wanted. Yeah, uh, very close to Patton. Matter of fact, I, would, I even had a mortar that uh, Theodore Roosevelt told me to put on his Jeep. He thought some Germans were shooting at him. From Sicily, um, you're getting ready then for the invasion of, of no, Europe, the, is that correct? Uh, and where did you t train or gather for that? It, it was around Plymouth, England. You went back to Plymouth again? Yeah. All right. Now tell us about your getting up to June of '44 and the invasion of Normandy. Uh, do you remember getting on your ship where you were at Plymouth? Uh, I remember we were supposed to go on for some training, and then we were supposed to practice some landing and go down the rope ladders on the side of the ships. Why I remember this is I had an awful toothache. It was one o'clock in the morning, and the ship doctor, the dentist, he uh, filled three of my teeth and pulled one, <laughs> all in one sitting. So I never practiced and made that practice landing. But the, the actual ship, the name of the ship, I don't know. I just. Uh, now, what beach did you go to? Omaha. You went to Omaha Beach. I was the second wave on, on that landing. On the 6th of June. The day, but the second wave. Can you Africa tell us, was, tell I was us the about... the first wave, and Sicily, I think I was the first wave. Tell us about looking at Normandy Beach that day. What yeah. were your impressions? Just like if you've seen any of the movies, that was it. The, the private life of uh, Ryan there. Matter of fact, I just, after two years, I just got that about five, six months ago to look at it, and... Was it like that? It was like that. It, when you got bit, out of the A little bit of boat? Hollywood. A little bit, any of these movies, there's a little bit of Hollywood. Yeah. Because when I, I was taking, I was going to write notes. I took a pad and a pencil, and uh, there was a machine gun firing at us on the beach. Well, there was, there was no machine guns right on the beach. No German machine guns. We get out of the water, and if I recollect that I was told this, that they'd have to look it up in history. The 1st Infantry Division, we lost 900 men before we got out of the water. And then we had to cross some sand, then there was a little inlet of water from the ocean, and then there was this buff that probably had to be about 100 feet high. And that's what was giving us all the problems, the Germans up in that buff. And the and tide's coming in, so you, you've got to get off the in. beach. I mean, as a matter of fact, I was right aside of Colonel Taylor, as far as from me to you, and he said, uh, 
the words are out there in, the, in, the, in my book. But they wrote a book, uh, the first division, the infantry division wrote a book, and matter of fact, I just got to read it. After having it for 50 years, I just started to read it a couple of days ago. He says, should we die on land, uh, should we die on the beach, let's die on land and let's get in there. And those were his words, I, I still remember them. How did you get off the beach with this big bluff? Uh, it was a continuation of, of just fighting and uh, one kid, I don't know his name, dropped all his equipment, got all the hand grenades you could get. I don't know how he got up there. And I still don't remember his name. And he got, when we found him, when we finally got up there, he had 21 bullet holes through him, and he was still alive. He got the Congressional Medal of Honor and made lieutenant. Was this a kid in your outfit? He wasn't in my company, no. But I do have, in the First Division, I think, I don't know if it's since World War I or World War II, 16 Congressional Medal of Honor winners. And I had a kid named James Reese, who's got the Congressional Medal of Honor. He was one of my mortar men. That was in the Battle of uh, Truina. Can I ask a, a, a very personal question here? You, you're pretty sure you're going to die on that beach, or, or you have to get off of it, and you get up over this bluff. How, when did you know that you might make it? You still walk, and so, <laughs> yeah, and then nobody did. I, I don't know, you know, I don't know all the history. I mean, it was shortly after that. I was a section sergeant then, but it was shortly after that, I became platoon sergeant. Was, uh, they put the platoon sergeant in a straitjacket and they sent him home because he was getting pretty bad. You just uh, advance, advance, advance. Where, we where did you go when, France, when you got off the beach? Where did you go from we there? We went right to a town by the name of Comont, France. We actually stayed there almost a month. And we just uh, kind of idle. Germans were there, very close. And uh, matter of fact, that Comont, France, is uh, where I had took my uh, spool of wire for my mortars. I had across the street, and the Germans were firing their machine guns down that street. When I got on the other side, I directed mortar fire to knock out three machine guns. And they put me in for the Silver Star, but I came back, the quarter was full. I was put in for that battle three times, but never got it. And uh, I still remember that the Germans used to send up this monstrous gun on a on a railroad car and fire it at us. And they'd been, bet Chuck Charlie would come over every night. Didn't know where he was dropping the bomb, but he'd drop a bomb somewhere. Bed Chuck Charlie. This is bed just to Charlie. keep you awake. Hey, at come night. around, Chuck. <laughs> yeah. You took your un unit, you say, lost 900 men that never got out of the water. Um, th this month that you had, was this to regroup? Uh, more or less. We, we, we got up to the Comont France, was one of the towns close to the beach. And uh, I don't know what the plan, the, the big shots are, but we stayed there for about a month and then we started to move in. Moving again. Yeah. Did you have any idea what your overall objective was? That were you told where, what the next town was? Where were you going? Well, there, there were a few times. Well, we're going to take that hill. You know, we're we're going to take that town. When we did it, well, then the, the, there was a couple of questions. They thought, a couple of questions there about R and R. You come to that. Well, I didn't even know what those letters were. <laughs> Rest Railroad, <and> rare. yeah. <laughs> Well, as you made your way across, headed toward the uh, either the Belgian or the German border, yeah. uh, the season was wearing on, and you were how many of the guys in in, in your original the original outfit? yeah I would bet you that when I was sent home, there wasn't a dozen guys that made the three DD invasions up front on the front lines. Like, it's hard to figure out. It's hard to tell. It would be hard to. Estimate it would be hard to check on that, but yeah. Now, now we're skipping ahead of a little bit here. Right. Um, you you were at Bastogne, or, or you were at Belgium, part of the Battle of the Bulge. Yeah, that that's in there. That's the end. Yeah. 
And uh, w what did you do as you moved along through uh, well, Germany? We had to fight for different hills, different towns, and we were in combat all the way right up to Aachen, Germany. Did, did you feel that you uh, were properly equipped? Did you have oh, good we clothes? We were definitely equipped then. Uh, were you warm enough, yeah. cold enough, whatever? Well, if you want to go back a little bit now in Africa, I actually wore out the soles of my shoes almost. My feet were almost on the ground. Uh, food, we had one can of beans every day for about three months. We had no mail for about eight months. I'm sorry. We had no mail for about four or five months. We had no airplanes. We, every once in a while, the British Spitfire would come over and give us a little bit of the air protection or something until we got into our mass production. Then we started getting the P-47s, P-51s, P-38s, B-17s, and then, then we were well equipped. Did that, did that affect you as an infantryman? Suddenly you, you've got your own planes over the air, you oh, didn't have to look up, you it knew was it was nice. Ours. I remember one time looking up, it was a, a sight for, to, to behold. 3,000 B-17s and 800 P-38s as escorts were maneuvering and getting into formation. And they were up high enough, they were all even vapor trails. And if you want to see something, that was something. How about the other way around? Were you ever strafed or bombed by the Germans? Oh, yes. Tell us about that. What's it, what's it like uh, to be shot at from an airplane? Well, well, one of our first battles in Africa was almost pretty close to hand-to-hand -hand combat, but we both ran into each other by surprise. And I tried to fire my mortars. I put my knife out, my bayonet rather, out for the name and stake. And I tried to fire my mortar so it would land about 50 yards in front of me, which was almost impossible. And we got down behind our, we had our packing bags with us and everything. And when we emptied those after it was all over, because we immediately, well, one fellow got bayoneted right near me, but immediately we separated. We moved back a little bit and the Germans moved back. Everybody was so sub came up by surprise. There were a lot of bullets in those bags, you know. But that was a... Uh, you were so close to the Germans, you were firing mortar shells to burst 50 yards away. Oh, I was trying to, yeah. No success, though. I didn't fire too many. You might as well have picked it up so and fast. thrown a forward pass. You were yeah. that, that close. Yeah. Okay, we're in Europe. Uh, I, I'm sorry tonight, we're, uh, this is, you have so much to tell, we seem to skip around. Oh, I could tell you the 15 different ways I saw men dead. Uh, unbelievable. Hang grenades in their hands, behind a machine gun, one body burning with a flame. We couldn't put, even put it out. It was out in the little field about 50 yards away, and, and uh, enemy artillery was landing there. I saw one fellow standing up with a shoe cut, wedged between in a mountain in a crevice, and, and his rifle in his hand, and he was dead. It looked like the, the Minute Man down at Lexington. Where was that? This was in Africa. In Africa. Yeah. In, in Europe, that is, when you're going across France, um, did you run into their soldiers from other armies, other allies? Did you meet Frenchmen? Did you meet anybody we had, from... Oh, yeah, we met the uh, Frenchmen. British, we met some Australians. British. We had the Gomes attached to us. That's an African tribe of soldiers, every one of them had to be about six foot tall. They wore like a, a mattress cover for a gown, and they had no shoes on. The soles of their, the skin of their feet was three-eighths of an inch thick. They never wore shoes. And I'm glad they were on our side, because they could go up and touch a helmet and tell if it was an American or a German. Okay, um, I think your winter is coming on in Europe for you. Is that correct that uh, after a while you uh, had landed in June and you yeah. had this 30 days, that takes you into July, then you go through the rest of the summer. Uh, I've asked you if your clothing was adequate. 
Yes. You talked, you talked about the food a minute ago. Oh, the food, that, that was back in Africa. We didn't even have the food. What about uh, in Europe, though? Were you properly fed as you're, you're moving, moving, moving? Very rare that we get a hot meal. It was always the, the C rations. Yeah. And then they eventually came out with K rations, which was supposed to be a little bit better. Yeah. Well, you spent a year in combat. More than a year. More than a year. Oh, yeah, about a year, yeah. And can you tell us now about working up toward this, um, the Battle of the Balls? You were part of that one in addition oh, that, to uh, D-Day? I was only there for about a week. That was around Christmas time. Yeah. The clothes were adequate. We had good clothes. But that was uh, I lost probably it. one of the worst winters in, in Europe in 50 years. Yeah. And, and you were, were you warm enough? Layers of clothes. So the, the army proved layers of clothes was better than one garment. Gloves would, uh, would like, would, like, would uh, be uh, woolen gloves, but then the leather mittens all over them. Mm -hmm. And uh, at, that, at that battle, I lost about eight or nine bazooka men, too, when, the, when those tanks broke through at the Battle of the Bulge. Now, you, had the, you told us about the incident with the tank that passed by you or right over you. Um, were the Americans, did the American line hold, or did you guys... Well, they broke through, but finally we won. So the, the, you know, when you're a platoon side, you're interested in 48, 50 men. And I know nothing about the, the office on my left, the office on my right. I was just interested in, in my men. So you, yeah, I don't have the whole picture, just... They broke through us, but yet we still, we won that. I guess one of the problems for them was uh, they ran out of gas, yeah. literally, quite That's literally. That's according to the history. And that, that the sun finally came out so you could get some good air support to help you guys. What happened after the Battle of the Bulge? What happened to you personally? There I went home. I was sent back. You were called in and told You'd had enough. I went to, yes. Yeah. I went to Fontainebleau, France, and I stayed there a couple of weeks training rear echelon officers for frontline duty. And then I went home. And then when I went home, I was supposed to go back. It was only a 45 day furlough. And then even here at home, when I reported back, I had gotten married in the meantime. And again, they told me, you are not going back overseas. And then the war ended. How did you get home when they sent you when home? I was, it was on a, I think it was a major marine ship or something. No Queen Mary this time? No. no. <laughs> now how about, how about coming home and, and seeing your family and coming seeing home, reality? Coming home, that's what I wanted you to remind me. They told us, they, uh, they gave us some papers to read, and I, I, it's hard for me to explain it, but I'm not the... I don't have that vocabulary of words to use, but they said you might be frightened, which was the, was, was the case. When I got down to Fort Devens, I got rented a room, and I locked myself up for three days before I went home. And I only lived about 40 miles away from Fort Devens to Malden. I was frightened to go home. Were you alone, Seth? Or I was had alone. anybody, anybody when I else got from your I just went down to... Uh, the barber shop, which was in there, I got a haircut, I got a room, and I locked myself up for three days. Can you can you bring yourself to tell us about that? What your feelings were? Well, then finally, I took a train home, or however I got home, I forgot. And I called up the house, and uh, there was uh, one of my relatives there came down and got me. And then I walked into the house, and there was my father, my mother. Big hugs. It'd been a long time since you'd gone away, wasn't it? it was, uh, yeah. And you'd been through they a lot. Sent me, they sent me a lot. Of, gave me a lot of prayers. My father walked downtown. I think it was in Sisti. He sent me 34 packages. He must have went down twice in one day, a couple of days, in, in a month's time. And I only got about two of those packages. Some of them were sunk. Some of the Germans got, some of them the Americans got, maybe, I don't know. They felt that it wasn't going to get where it was going. 
Were you able to ever take time out to write home and tell them what you were going through? I did my writing right to, in the field. I had it in combat. Were your letters on censored? On a clipboard. Were your letters censored? Did somebody read them before they went or out? Well, if you remember, they used to make uh, reduce the letter to like a little postcard to to so it wouldn't be so and, and V mail. Yeah, e yeah. Is yeah. that what it was? Email, yeah. What were the greatest challenges that you faced in combat? Greatest challenges? In combat. Quite a few. Quite a few. So the greatest challenge is to stay, stay alive. <laughs> the longer you were in it, did you get to the point where you realized that this is a, something you you are trained for, and the better trained guy survived, and the the younger kids did. I think the training didn't. helped me quite a bit. Yeah. The endurance, being young, being able to take the physical punishment, was actually a big factor. Yeah. When you were wounded, you were shot through the shoulder, and you made your way back to an aid tent. Um, what kind of medical treatment did you get? Well, they saw it. I don't remember if they dressed it or what. I went immediately went to a Belgian hospital, and from there I went to England, and I got well, and I went back up front. Do you today ever uh, feel any effects of your wound? No. How about the quality of the leadership, your officers, your in combat? The leadership was very, very good. Percentage-wise, we probably lost more lieutenants, percentage-wise, mm -hmm. than uh, infantrymen or whatever. But they would come up from this uh, officer's candidate school, and they, they knew they had responsibility. I would even tell them, go to the rear of the platoon, or stay with me, but stay aside of me. Don't try to be brave. And oh no, they grab the telephone, they'd go out there and get killed. Uh, percentage wise, matter of fact, one of the first ones I lost was a lieutenant, he was 22 years old, Lieutenant Kelly. I got a message out there that he sent me, this was back in Africa. I still have the message, I happened to put it in my wallet and I still got it out there, a little yellow slip. Mm. Do not take Hill 444 under fire for some reason or other. And now that I'm reading my uh, First Division book, I came to that page, I'm highlighting all the things that I ran across. And uh, <laughs> I find myself highlighting a lot of things. Because that Hill 4-4 is in the book. And you've got a personal message about it anyway. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, but we lost a lot of officers, and the officers were good. Because of their sense of responsibility, you say. Yeah. Is that correct? <clears throat> Oh, yeah, yeah. It's pretty tough to lose a lot of men. There were six other sergeants that had become lieutenants. The sergeant, my, uh, one of my uh, platoon sergeants, James G.I. Owen was his name, and he became lieutenant. And there was a six of them all together, just in our company. I don't know if you could do this, but to, because you were being shot at and mortared at all the time, but if, if, you, if you take Normandy, if you take the Kasserine Pass, if you take Sicily, if you take the Battle of the Bulge, can you rate them in terms of their ferocity or where did you feel you're never going to get out of this and maybe you felt at another one that I'm going to well, make like everybody it else. If you were to tell a hundred, the GIs were good that way. Well, I, I'm going to compare with Germans now. They trained a lot of men to be the officers. I don't know how good their the infantry men were. Their privates, whatever. In in our American kids, everyone had initiative. They they were the they they they, they could do things. I lost track of what I was going to say, but they all, if you asked a hundred guys to volunteer for a job, but they would say only 99 of you are coming back, 
they would go around and shake each other's hand. It was nice knowing you. That was the initiative of, of our American GIs. It was great. But you, you personally, when you look back 50 some years at say four or five major land battles in the war, you were there. Can you think now of which of these was the worst? Which was the most difficult for you? Well, there's three or four I had in mind. That, that the one uh, going into dark in Germany, the one at Troina where that my, uh, my uh, James Reese got his Congress Medal of Honor. Uh, it was on the side of a hill, and, and uh, it was all rocks. I remember my foxhole was a big stone on the top side of a slight slope, and I built a wall of stones around it for my foxhole. And then I went to the left two or three hundred yards to get on the top of the ridge to see if I could see the Germans and direct my fire, my mortar fire. In the meantime, we were on this side of the hill. We could actually throw hand grenades and have them roll down on the other side of the hill and hit Germans. I lost all my machine gunners there. And I had one machine gunner who was an Indian who should have got the Congressional Medal of Honor also. Because he fired all the rounds from one machine gun Fired all the rounds from the other machine gun, fired all the rounds from the third machine gun, took his rifle, crawled over the hill, firing his rifle until he got killed. And uh, that was quite a battle. You said very earlier when you said, mentioned the Silver Star, that there was a quota. Is that for the division? So many guys in the big red one are going to get a Silver Star? Is that what you meant? Well, the, the, there were so many them put in for it, and according to the government, let's say they had 50 of them to give out, they had given them all out. Yeah. When they submitted mine, the quota was full, I didn't get it. Is that also true of the uh, Medal of Honor? That just so many are going to be given oh, out? Oh, I don't know about that. This kid did get the Congress Medal of Honor, though. On the other one, he, I didn't, nobody submitted him to in for the medal. If I was capable or able of doing it I, at that time, the, the, the kid really deserved it. I can't even remember his name now. Mm. That was a long time ago, yeah. wasn't it? How did you hear about what was going on in the rest of the war? You said uh, just a second ago that uh, your war was pretty much the area you could see and mm. you were responsible for. Well, did you get news about what's happening elsewhere in the world? As far as that goes, uh, I always felt even today, I give credit to everybody. The people making the bullets, the people working in the factories. I give credit to everybody. If they couldn't be there, they were doing it one way or another. So I give credit to everybody. I, I guess I'm asking also then, um, while you were laboring very hard in, in Europe, did you know what was going on in the Pacific against the... Well, uh, I, 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 I just say to myself, I'm glad I'm not there. <laughs> but it was bad enough in Europe, but I don't think I could take the Pacific. Matter of fact, I couldn't even take tanks. I'd seen guys coming out of tanks with their eyes popping out of their heads. But so I watched a big tank battle. And it was this big range of mountain, Horseshoe Mountain. It had to be miles from one end to the other. And Pat and the Germans battled it out like crazy. And uh, for me to be, a, I got claustrophobia. I would never be in a tank. You didn't want any part of that. No. And they're probably looking it over uh, you grunts. And I was happy to be infantry. <laughs> they don't want any part of that. Uh, okay, you said this question was going to come up, R and R. Uh, did you ever get off the line? Once. Once. Where did you go? Where did we go? They came up. This was after about three or four months in Europe. We went back, we hopped off the truck, we hopped right back on the truck, right back up to the front. They got news and, uh, that, they, that they needed us up there. So actually for uh, that half a minute, I never had R&R. 
So what are you complaining about? <laughs> oh, the, the half a minute? Yeah. That wasn't bad. <laughs> you mean to tell me they... they we got off the truck, literally. Yeah. And they and got off, news that you right were back needed back on, and they yeah. said that's enough, right? <laughs> oh, that's awful. USO shows, did you ever hear about anybody going to one? I was at one one yeah. time. Matter of fact, I think it was Bing Crosby. And the, the, the part of that story was, the entertainment was great. There was a B-17 just coming over the treetops with three of the motors out and only one prop going. And he was right in the middle of a song and all of us watching the show we were applauding the airplane. Come on, make it. And uh, naturally, Bing Crosby went along with that, and, and uh, that's the only show I ever saw. Where was this, Seth? Where was the plane trying to get to? It had to be early, but we weren't in the, too much in the heat of combat at the time. I, I, no, I had to go to Africa, sometime in Africa. That must have been a very dramatic thing. Oh, yeah. Very dramatic. Yeah. And then on occasion, the Red Cross, like you say, were people helpful. They were very, very helpful. The only thing is, it was tough. They came up to me and said, you can send a, out of your squad of eight or ten men, you can send two men over for coffee. The Red Cross is over there. How do I pick two men to go over for coffee? Because that's all they had. Yeah. Before you got into combat, where well, you fought against Italians and uh, that was that was a couple of days. From what I could gather, I'm not but sure about that But largely against history. the Germans, mostly it, against it, the it, Germans. It's probably in the history books when they actually came on our side. What What was your opinion of the German army before you closed with them and had combat against them? Well, I, 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 we captured a lot of Germans. 100,000 at least in the end of Africa. Kids had families. They were human beings just like us. Did you ever get to talk to any of the POWs you picked up? Only when I came back. There was a lot of them working at the PX at Fort Devons. And I worked there for a couple of months. There were a lot of German prisoners working there. Was your feeling after the war, or after you got to thinking about it, did you, your feeling about the German army, uh, did you think better of them, worse of them, or about the same? No, I just uh, put the blame on one man, that's all. They probably did what I had to do. Did you, f I guess I've asked you this in another way, when you were in all of these different engagements, do you feel you were properly equipped? That yeah. your, your equipment is, was good or is better than what they oh, had on the other good. side? Yeah. Well, once we had, um, got established. And you also had good solid air support after a while. Oh, definitely. Oh. Can you give us an example of any time that um, you were in the trenches or in your foxhole or whatever and air support helped you or was useful to you? Well, it's hard to explain. I know we were straight a couple of times with some ME-109s, but the, the air battle that was going on, uh, I don't know what the end result was to that. But Did the U.S. Air Force uh, ever uh, bomb or strafe positions in front of you that made it easier for you? Well, <laughs> I don't know if it should be down in the history books or not, but that big mission that I was telling you about, some of the bombs dropped on our people. I'm not sure about the name. I think it was General McNair. I never looked it up. I never had anybody look it up. I think he, he, get killed he was killed yes, from he our, was. one of our bombs. Yeah. But they dropped him shot. Now, communication, if communication was perfect, wars wouldn't last two days. Many, many times we were advancing. Our own artillery is firing in front of us. And then the Germans would get on the lines and tell our uh, artillery men, you're firing too far. They were shorting up and our own artillery would land on us. And they, they, they had so many ways of getting, 
they would fire traces, say I'm here, the Germans are firing at me, and they would fire traces over my head. The Germans over here would fire traces over my head. The artillery would pick up those traces and drop bombs, drop their bombs right on that spot. They, they had a lot of, a lot, the tricks of, of the a trade. lot of games, and the, it's a big game. Can you think of anything you learned that um, you hadn't been taught in, in training camp, but that saved your life because you learned it in the field? You said you used your knife as an aiming point. An aiming stake for my yeah. mortar, yeah. Did you learn that back at uh, Fort Did I learn Dennis? that? Yeah, or did you learn it out in the field? No, I had a lot of good initiative. I've got it now in my work. I'm still working. and. Uh, Although I never went to school, I taught myself math, and I am pretty good in math. And all that came from... You had a long career and a lot of time in combat. Is there a most memorable experience you would want to tell us about tonight? One thing that stands out in your mind more than well, other Well, there are two things. stories that I told you. There's an awful lot. There's so many. I can't put my finger on anyone. The United States of America makes a great deal out of D-Day because it was for them the largest land battle in Europe. Would you say maybe that for your personal career might be the thing you think about more than other things? Well, uh, the going in the second wave was probably almost as bad as going in the first wave. Uh, they had bulldozers on the beach, plowing holes as big as this building and pushing men in there. Then they had to redig them up. That was for the morale of the fallen waves coming in. The fallen waves coming in, if they saw all that, those dead bodies, uh, they would probably go mentally crazy. Or and uh, a lot of things like that. All part of You, You looked at Saving Pri Private Ryan. I saw it, yeah. Yeah. Did that bring back anything that you hadn't remembered about combat, or did you look at parts of that and say that's not no, the way that it was? was uh, that was all about a squad looking for a man. And even, uh, matter of fact, it was on a week ago. I just happened to turn the TV on the longest day. Mm -hmm. That was the D Day of the Normandy. And a lot of that was realistic, too. All these movies naturally have a little bit of Hollywood. They go a little bit overboard sometimes. But it's all pretty much true. Is there one person that you remember of all your time in the Army, one character that stands out in your mind? Some lot, guy you remember? Or well, I remember one, but we came back together and then he married his girlfriend and we used to go roller skating. I married the, the girl that I used to go roller skating with. Not got serious until I was overseas. But uh, it's just a crazy coincidence that it doesn't come into the, under the, this, uh, the story about combat. I never met a person I know, but when it was all over, I met three people that became my brother in laws. The barber became my brother in law. The Colonel Webb, who was in charge of the troops in Fontainebleau, France, became my brother-in-law. And uh, I met my brother-in-law, who was on the ship 344, I think, number 344. He was a sailor. And he landed me in Sicily. And of all the people that I met overseas, three of them were my brother-in-laws. <laughs> You became a matchmaker and then didn't realize it. Is there all the terrible things you went through? It's almost odd to ask you this, but was there a humorous experience that you remember? Sometime you had the good laugh and uh, broke the tension, or just something funny that happened to you or somebody near you? No. No, it was all pretty much serious. Pretty serious all stuff. My stories are. Dead soldiers. I well, 
When and where were you discharged, Seth? I was discharged from Fort Devens. At Fort Devens. And... Can you remember approximately the date? Uh, I was discharged. Uh, I had married April 19th. I was discharged in May of 45. And you got married on April 19th? That was April 21st. 21st, almost 45. Patriot's Day. What rank uh, did you hold when I you were discharged? The, the, the last rank I held was platoon sergeant. Platoon sergeant. And what decorations did you have? Well, I had the Bronze Star twice, and I got the, some of them out there, the Purple Heart. The one I'm proud of is the European Theater of Operation. Because on that I wear six bronze stars, six major battle stars, and one arrowhead, which is D-Day. I made three D-Day invasions, but I had the one arrowhead on my ribbon. And you have North Africa. Yeah. You have that one too. Well, that, that comes under... Did you join um, any reserve unit after you came home, or was that... They wanted the, me to be a recruit. Uh, a recruiting officer, something out of Fort Devens, but I didn't, didn't want any part of it. You were out. That 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 was it. And did you join any veterans organizations when you got Definitely. home? <clears throat> I've been with the Legion now 55 years. I was with the Disabled American Veterans 114 chapter, Bill P. Harvey here in Natick, about 25 years ago, and the, the AMFETS, VFW, belong to them all. It's, I know it's a long time ago, but uh, can you remember what your feelings were? You told us about locking yourself in a room for three days. Why, why did you do that? Because uh, <laughs> they told me that this was going to happen. Not, and not because they told me, but I have a, a funny feeling that uh, as though you had to learn the English language all over. You had to, I don't know. I can't explain it. I don't have the vocabulary to explain it. You were in the Army a long time and made a lot of friends and, and lost a lot of friends. Did In that three days for you, was there a sense of transition? You were going from one huge world into one that you well, used to know? Well, that's probably uh, the size of it, the way to look at it. Yeah. And did you, you said you talked to your dad. Did, did you talk with your mother or the rest of your family about what I you'd been know. through? Oh, yeah. Well, I just went into the kitchen, and they were there, and uh, I didn't say very much. I just knelt down and put my head on my mother's lap, and that was it. In the time after that, in the, in, in the years after that, did you talk with your family about what you've talked with us to, about tonight? Yeah. I, 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 what got me going, <clears throat> I rarely told anybody, even my children. I want to mention right now that my son is a decorated veteran in Vietnam, and his, his wife got me to come here today. And uh, I really told my children, but when I went out to the Legion about three years ago, a fellow came up and shook my hand and says, thank you very much for this country that I'm living in. And it kind of stirred me up and made me feel so good. And one day I'm going out the door and about five or six kids, about 16 and 17 years old, corralled me. This is right in town here, and they had me talk for half an hour. They wouldn't let me go. And then there was a woman that shook my hand one day. And for, for the 52 years, I never went to the Legion at all. <laughs> I just started going lately. It made me feel good, and all of a sudden, I want to let it all out. So I started talking with my grandson, who's with the Joint Chiefs of Staff in, out in Virginia. I had him down about two months ago, down the house. And I talked to him for about an hour, and then he was very appreciative of it, and uh, glad I talked about it. Well, we're glad you came here tonight because you you covered a lot of ground that uh, you know yeah. for many people is just history books, but you lived through it. Can you answer a question of uh, how important for you was being in the military? Uh, <coughs> I don't know exactly what you want from that question. 
Did it affect your life in any way? Oh, I don't Is think your so. life different because you were in the military? No. The only thing different would be that I didn't meet the woman that I married, and uh, I wouldn't do that any different. So it was I met her at roller skating and uh, down at Whalen Park. But that probably would be the only different thing about the whole life. That's that's an important. And then I got four beautiful children. Yeah. Ten, and you can you remembered. Uh, you told us tonight about going into the service. Uh, what did you think then about the war you were about to go into and the motives of the country? And, and what do you think now about that war? Is there any difference in your mind? Then I didn't give it any thought at all. There was uh, work was scarce, and this fellow and I decided to go in the army. And. Uh, I don't know what the answer would be for what I think about it now. I think we're everything has settled down to what it should be. Do you think there was um, any difference in the way you were treated when you came home from the service and came home and came back into uh, civilian life? Uh, the way the people around you treated you, and the way the guys that came home from Korea were treated, or your, your son that came home from Vietnam. Do you well, see a the difference? The only thing I can say about that, <clears throat> it's too bad that the Vietnam was, you know, everybody likes a winner. And uh, I'm assuming now that we lost that, right? Why? I don't know. I knew if I saw a German, I could shoot at him, he could shoot at me. But the, the poor guys over to Vietnam, uh, they were told not to shoot. And uh, Korea, we lost, what, 59,000 there? That was, uh, so in your mind, there, there were differences between your coming home and what, say, your son experienced? I didn't get that that in your mind you do see differences between how you were received when you came home and say what oh. happened to your son? Yeah, there's a slight difference there. I don't know how to put it. I felt that you'd be better treated, but we are recognizing all that now. Uh, we lost a lot of men for what reason, I don't know. Did you ever receive any benefits from the VA, such as uh, hospitalization, uh, GI Bill, insurance, anything you know, like I got that? The, 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 GI, the, the initial GI Bill there. I went to training for the job that I had, um, let me see, 43, 53, about 55 years ago. I was making plastic molds for 10 years, and I've been working 43 years for my brother, sheet metal fabricating. And that came from the training, the GI Bill. And I had a little disability, which I had from the wounds. We're almost at uh, the end of this tape, Seth. Um, somebody's gonna, a lot of people are gonna look at this over the years. A, a long time from now, they're gonna look at it well, and look at this time. Let me come, because if all of a sudden I, I want to let it out, and, and if people are going to want to notice 50 years down the road, good. How about, what message would you give somebody looking at this tape 50 years from now? What, more than anything else, would you like them to know about you and what you went through? Well, naturally live a good life. If they have to do what I had to do, I don't think that'll ever happen again. I don't think that'll be another world war. But, uh, if it came, then do what I had to do. Thank you, Seth, for being with Thank us you tonight. Too. Very much appreciated. Thank you, Bob.